All right, everybody. I am super excited to have the Master Passive Income Show today. I'm super excited for you to be here. And I am going to be interviewing somebody that's a fantastic investor, fisherman, and a great person in general. Chris Baldwin, thank you so much for being here on the show today. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me, Dusty. Now, I'm you and I have known each other for a little while. In fact, we went to the same church and we got to know each other and we just started talking about investing. You know, our family's getting together, having dinner and stuff, started talking about investing. And then you said, you know, I really would like to start investing. You also love fishing as well. So we hit it off really, really quickly and hunting and all that sort of stuff. But um, what I remember about you is that you were just gung ho and you're saying, you know, I'm going to do it. And what I found a lot of people when they start, they get started investing or they want to invest, they don't really put their full effort into it. And you absolutely have done that. You've got, you're destroying the ability. Like you're, you're making it so, it looks easy. The, watching you do this, it looks easy. So <laughs> I, let's talk about all this sort of, okay. So when you and I first met, did you have any properties? Did you have anything? Were you investing at all? Not at all. Uh, I had a life mentor that had a couple properties and, and he mentioned that you know, earlier in life, maybe a year or two before I met you. So that, that seed was kind of planted and it was, you know, but, but when I met you, I just graduated college, was ready for the next phase of my life. And it was just the perfect time to meet you and the stuff um, you were telling me about this and then uh, uh, got a hold of your book. And that was the very first investment book I read. And, and that just got me started on this path. And so you got my book, you started reading and we were just talking more and more about just investing in general. And what got you over that hurdle to say, you know what, I really am going to do this. I'm going to start investing and buy a first investment property. What got you over that hurdle? Well, I've always been kind of an adventure seeker, kind of a risk taker used to skydive and ride bulls and rock climb and do all that stuff. And uh, each phase of the life, I was kind of doing a different hobby. So this kind of came in at right at the right moment. And uh, uh, it just kind of, I transitioned right into it. And yeah, it just kind of filled that gap. And um, so I just taking the uh, uh, risk wasn't really a big thing. Um, it was just getting out and doing it. And the main thing that really kind of uh, encouraged me was uh, I'm a charter captain and I love doing what I do. I love coming up here. I love taking people fishing. Um, and I just got married and I just, you know, I told my wife that uh, I was going to keep doing this right till I graduated college, you know, and then I graduated college and I really didn't want to give up fishing. So uh, this real estate initially was just something to allow me to, to supplement my income. So I could support a family and still do what I love, you know. So it was it was more to support the lifestyle that I really was dreaming about and the lifestyle that I'm living now. And um, and I, if it wasn't for the uh, passive or the the rental income coming in every month, I don't think I'd be able to support my family doing what I do. So it's and been, so uh, for really er great yeah, for everybody listening. What Chris, uh, when I first met him, what he would do, he lived in Fresno, but then would drive all the way up to Alaska and fish up there, be a, a charter boat captain for a fishing company over there, um, Barnoff Fishing. And I've actually been there two or three times now. We try to get up there and fish with Chris because Chris and I are good friends and we try to go fishing because um, it's amazing fishing up there. The company that works for is terrific as well as Chris is a phenomenal fisherman. I mean, you want to say, hey, where do you want to? Hey, Chris, where are the fish at? Oh, uh, they're right there. And you go and you get the fish. It's It's phenomenal. So uh, what was great was he would drive up to Alaska and then fish and then come back. But as we started talking more and more about investing, we I was sharing with you that I was investing out of state. Was that interesting to hear that somebody can invest far away? And how did you get to the point where you said, you know what, I actually want to do this where I'm investing out of state? Sure. And, and what you pretty much planted was the dream, you know, it's possible to do this, you know, and so the investing out of state was more of when I started kind of going down that path, it's like, okay, so I have this dream, how do I accomplish this dream? Because I lived, we lived in, we were in Fresno, California, and that's a really tough place to kind of do buy and hold where you're going to cash flow off these properties. Uh, so uh, yeah, and and so you you mentioned out of state and uh, actually got me in contact with some, with uh, kind of your, your network that you had and which was awesome. So I just kind of fell right into the the, the, the wide path that you've already kind of led there and uh, ended up buying a place um, in Ohio and uh, 
still own it today. And that, that kind of got my feet wet there. So um, big so, question. Have you ever been to Ohio? No, <laughs> I've, I've never seen the place. And, you know, <laughs> honestly, I don't know if I ever will, or I, I don't know if I ever want to, you know, but uh, it's, it's been a great, great thing for us. Um, I mean, I've shoot five years I've owned it and uh, uh, pretty much I've made, if the place burned down and I don't get another penny going forward, I've already kind of made enough that um, I made my money back on it. So it wouldn't be a loss at this point, you know? Yeah. And uh, so that's a, that's a great place to be, you know? That is um, a great place. My, so uh, when, how long ago did you buy that first property in Ohio? Uh, I believe it was about five years ago. Okay. So from five years ago, you've been making cash flow every single month. What was it that got you, or how, how did you get the financing to be able to pay for it? Did you save up all the money in cash? Did you put a down payment down? How did you do that? Well, uh, I've part of, part of the strategy here and the, the key to it is, is living frugally. And, and that's something we've always done. My wife is the most frugal person that I have ever met, uh, which is great, you know? Um, but so, so we both live frugally. And so, um, you know, we, we own all everything outright. We don't own our cars. We pay cash. We drive older cars. I mean, look, I, I, I don't dress nice, you know, as you could see. <laughs> um, and so when you do that, you kind of have, you end up having a surplus of income cause it, you, you know, you, you start and then you kind of get ahead of your finances, right? Because now you start saving instead of spending, you know, getting credit card loans or, or getting loans for cars. So you're kind of spending future money. So instead of that, you know, you start saving in that and that extra money. And so we, we had a nice, uh, we, we just had a, some money in the bank and we actually paid cash for the property. And, um, you know, the, the, it wasn't a very high price point, you know, but, uh, so owning it outright kind of minimizes a lot of the risk, um, just because you don't have the big, uh, the bank wanting their payment every month. And so, um, it minimized the risk and just, it was a good way to kind of get started, get our yeah. feet wet. Yeah, and I love buying at a lower price point. If you're going to buy a $300,000 house, you're not going to make that much money. And even if you did, if it's not rented for one month, that's a lot of money in a mortgage payment you're going to have to fork over. Then might eat your entire year of passive income that you you normally would make. It's going to eat all up. And that's why we love buying. And for everybody listening, like if you're on the coast of America, like on the West Coast or East Coast, and you're thinking, wow, where do you find houses for like $50,000, $30,000 or whatever? There are They are out there. They are out there. And in fact, my students buy them all the time. Okay, so when you get a property, how do you buy a property without ever even visiting the state, without even seeing the property? How do you actually buy one without being there? Trust, lots of trust. You, you and it all comes down to just having uh, somebody on the ground that you could trust, and that's the one thing um, from a distance that I've learned is that because uh, you're not there to see it. If you get a repair. Uh, I mean, you don't know, I mean, you got to trust that it's, it was really repair and that everything's right. And so, uh, uh, you actually connected me with, uh, my property manager out there and, uh, he's, he would, uh, he'd find these places and, and we would talk and discuss about offers and he'd, he'd do the initial walkthrough. Um, and then after there was an accepted offer, we would do the inspection and no matter what I buy, um, I mean, you got to get inspected any kind of property, especially with real estate, hire a professional inspector. Uh, cause they are just, they're trying to see things that you don't, you know, even if, even if I'm here in Alaska buying a property, I always have an inspector and I'm the type I'll be crawling under the house with the inspector, asking them all these dumb, crazy questions, you know? Uh, but that's how I, I, I learn. And, uh, but, but from a distance, you know, you really got to have your network and you got to trust your network. And, and that is so, so key. I agree. And in building that business first, having the property manager, having either realtors or inspectors or plumbers or having the right people to do the work, that's really the way that you're going to be able to invest really, really far away and not have to fly there all the time. Okay. So then how do you manage a property that is literally thousands of miles away? How do you manage one? And, you know, because you get phone calls at every waking minute and even when you're not awake, you're going to get phone calls of problems. How do you manage those? Again, it comes down to the property manager and that's, that's why you got to have somebody good on the ground and they're kind of the buffer, you know, so they take a lot of these calls. Um, and, uh, he has a, he has a budget. He knows that he's just going to fix it. Right. And if it's over a certain amount, I'm going to get a call. Other than that, he's, he takes care of everything and he's great. He has his own network of all the plumbers and of, of, 
so it's it's really hands off just because if there's something uh, that I, that gets broken and or gets fixed, uh, I just get on the invoice. He just deducts it right out, gives me all the receipts, and it's that simple. And so it's really it's a great way of doing it. And um, up here in Alaska, I manage my properties up here, so I've seen both sides of that. And 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 I can tell you, it's really nice to have a property manager. <laughs> it sure is, especially when they do all the work. And all you do is get a statement at the end of the month. And like you said, it, as long as you're trustworthy, as long as you trust them that they're doing the work right and doing it properly, you literally don't have a care in the world. It's it's such a beautiful thing. Okay, so you have one property in Ohio. Where was your second property that you bought? So the second property we bought was uh, uh, up in Alaska. So the, the, the fishing company I work for, um, I, per, I told them that, uh, you know, once I graduate college, I'm probably going to have to get a you know, like a real job. Uh, and he really wanted to keep me around the owner, Chuck. And, uh, so he offered me a management position in the office during the winter time. So I said, so Amy, I'm actually going to keep fishing. I know I told you that, you know, I was probably going to get another job. We're going to keep fishing. And by the way, we're actually going to move up to Alaska full time. So, uh, so we came up here, we lived in a one bedroom apartment, um, uh, for a couple months while I was looking for a place. And uh, I bought a duplex here in Ketchikan, and uh, that's the, the place that we live now. So I essentially, uh, I moved in, and uh, you get owner-occupied financing, lower down payments, you get uh, lower interest rates, um, and we're renting out the upper, and it's keeping our expenses extremely low. So then you buy that place in Alaska, and it's a duplex, which is fantastic. It's basically, they call it house hacking. You buy a house where it has a unit where somebody else can rent out that unit, but you live in the other unit. And if there's three units total, you have two units rented. If there's four units total, you have three other units rented while you're living in one. And so what's great is, so Chris and I, for everybody watching and, and on this on YouTube and is also seeing this, Chris and I actually became really good friends. And so I have gone up there a number of times, stayed in his house with he and his amazing wife and kids and we go fishing. And it's tremendous fun. But if you look at the view outside of his front, like if you're looking at this on YouTube, his view out from his window, that's actually he's looking at right now. You can't see it because he's looking out the window. It's just beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. You got the ocean there. You have all these trees and gorgeous stuff. And so house hacking to get into a place that you're no longer renting and you are having somebody else rent from you. They're paying for the mortgage. You basically, if you do it right, you could potentially live rent free or even make money, which is exactly what you did. So you have a property in Ohio. Now you have a duplex in Alaska. Now you are also managing the one in Alaska, correct? And you were talking about lower interest rates and a little easier to buy. Why is that? Is it because you're an Alaskan, you're a citizen, or like you're you're um, you have a driver's license in Alaska? Is that why? Well. I actually got uh, this loan through Fannie Mae, which is kind of, it's a federal type loan. Uh, we we put the 20% down, uh, but if you're buying it strictly an investment, a lot of these um, loans require 25% down. So, and you know, 5%, uh, but the interest rates, and that's where the real difference is, is the interest rates are, uh, are quite a bit higher. I don't know off the top of my head how much higher, uh, but you know, when, when you're, you're factoring your cash flow, if you look at the interest rate, that's pretty much just your net income. I mean, I mean, that's, uh, it comes right off the bottom line. So lower interest rate just means you're going to profit more every month off it. And, uh, so that's, it was a, a great strategy for us here. That's great. So, and and oh, go ahead. And we do have some expenses, you know, I think it costs us a 1600 square foot apartment. Uh, we'd be paying if we paid rent to be 1600 and it's costing us about 400 bucks a month to live here. Okay. And there are other things like in Alaska, which not everybody, every place is going to have something like you need to paint constantly be painting the outside because of all the weather, yeah. things like that come up, but we just account for those in the expenses. And we just make sure we itemize out expenses beforehand before we buy the property. So we know what's going to happen. Now you're currently living in one unit and you're renting out the other one. And then now, so total, if you did move out and did it again, you have three units, basically. Now you continue to buy and get more properties. So what was your next property after that? Next property was a fourplex here in town. And uh, yeah, that's a property we just closed on uh, last year. So we've owned it for a year. And uh, yeah, I was fully occupied when uh, 
when we got it and we actually have the same tenants that we've had. And we, I mean, it's, um, it's been, it's been really, uh, good to us. Um, when we, when we first bought it, the, uh, the return was a little bit low, but there is the rents were a little bit low as well. So there was the potential was to, uh, you know, up the rents and, you know, that would make it a really good deal. Um, another thing that we really do that we've done well with our duplex is, um, uh, change the utilities out. So here in Alaska, there's oil heat. And so we got this duplex and it had a, um, uh, a single tank for oil. So that means, you know, everything else is subdivided, but if you have a duplex, you have one oil tank, your owner's paying all the oil cause you can't split it. So, uh, we, we got a home energy rebate. We put some heat pumps in. And, uh, so that in turn tied the heat to the electric, which pretty much split it out. So without increasing rent, we increased our monthly cash flow by 200 bucks a month. Just so by then you take, decreasing expenses. Yeah. Yeah. So then you take the 10 grand and you know, then you, you do the math on whatever 200 bucks a month, 2,400. So that's a, um, uh, you know, the return on investment, I'm sorry, it was about 20. So yeah, the return on investment was, uh, you know, over 20% just on that one move. So, uh, and that's better than you could. I mean, if you're, if you're buying a house, you're getting 20% cash on cash return. I mean, you're doing that. That's out of this world. Good. You know? So, uh, sometimes, and so this, this, uh, fourplex, you know, there's a $600 a month utility bill that, uh, uh, we pay every month and, and we factor that in. And so that's, so for me, when I see that and same thing, they have a single oil tank, uh, I just see a huge opportunity. And so, uh, you know, we put heat pumps in, we could, uh, you know, make another 400 bucks off that. Now that's a really, it goes from a, like a, we get the rents up to where they should be. We do that. It goes from a, a good investment to just a great investment. And the whole time you're doing this, you're also, uh, when you start getting to the multifamilies, you know, there's a bit of a cap rate. It's not as much as commercial, you know, cause, uh, but if you up the rents, you're just going to up the value of the property. And, and, you know, when you go to sell it, the potential buyers are going to be factoring their numbers and they're going to see that, that, uh, the higher rent and the lower expenses, and it's just going to get you a, a higher price for the property. Man. So now you have a fourplex, a duplex and a single family home. What is your yeah. next, or do you have anything else or do you have another yeah. opportunity coming up? So when I married, I married my wife. We had a, she had a house in Fresno. And so we moved out and we ran that out to her grandma for five years. And, uh, it was a, it was a bit of a mistake, uh, just because it was, I mean, no, 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 no I get wrong. Her I grandma get was awesome. No, not a problem with the tenant. It's just, um, if you live in a place two or five years, you're exempt from taxes when you sell it. So now we're looking at selling the place and now we're looking at a big tax bill, which is pretty much all the, all the profit we made off of the last five years is going to get eaten up by taxes. So, you, you know, we have options like 1031 exchange. You know, uh, but if we would have sold, uh, you know, we would have avoided a lot of hassle because we lived in it, and, you know. Uh, so, but you asked what's next. Um, so what we're doing is I see, I mean, we're on a We're on a good path. You know, I'm doing what I love, um, you know, and, and I, I turned down a big job, a big paying job to do this, like pay literally twice as much. You know, I turned it down because I just love fishing so much. And so for me, there's, there's a lot more important things than money. Uh, and living up here in this lifestyle is absolutely more important. So we're on a good path, but one of the things that I'm struggling with is, uh, it's just taken a long time to save up. I mean, we're these, um, the, the properties up here, you, you can't, you, you could buy a teardown for 250, you know? And you're not gonna you're not gonna cash flow off it. So the the price points on these property duplexes here are in the mid four hundreds for something good. So um, the and you know twenty percent of that is you know it's a, it takes a while to save that up. Eighty thousand. And of course yeah. there's yeah there's the snowball effect you know so we we saved up a lot quicker for that fourplex because we had the duplex and the next property we're gonna save up a lot quicker too and that you know that accelerates it pretty quick and that's that's a good plan uh but we're also looking at other things to um uh you know kind of speed up the amount of income that we're we're able to uh to make and um so one of the things uh we've i'm at the point now where where i'm able to take the winners completely off 
and and so that's a great thing which is also freeing me up to do other stuff uh went marlin fishing in maui and lived out there for six months and last year we stayed and we went to idaho and road tripped all around america and and uh again it's that lifestyle that is so important to me uh but what we're looking now is um i'm looking at, at possibly building spec homes here in alaska um you know again i've i've never i mean i could read a tape measure but that's about the extent of my ability but uh but I, I've truly, I feel and I've learned along that if, if there's a will, there's a way. And, and I see a, a good opportunity here um, in Ketchikan. Um, and so uh, I believe that's this next uh, winter I'm going to focus on learning. And the winter after, hopefully, we're going to be, uh, be building something. And um, so that's kind of what I see the next next phase. And, and, you know, once you get into building stuff, you know, the sky's the limit. You could really start building you, you build single families, you, you get that down and then, uh, you know, building apartments here. I mean, you could, you could do well, I believe. Absolutely. And I've been to Ketchikan a number of times and it's beautiful up there. And if everybody doesn't know, Ketchikan is a really big port for a bunch of cruise ships to go by there. And it's so beautiful. People go there just for fishing and it's a great place. And so listen to how everything Chris has been doing with going to be eventually building, but at the same time, having rentals. I mean, my goodness, this is a, a great, great market. Now, when you are building the business, when you're buying a new property, when you, is it nerve wracking to get that next property? Is it something that you have to push yourself through or is it just kind of internally, it's okay for you to do that? Because there, there's a little bit of a, of a fear factor for a lot of people when they're getting started. Hey, am I buying the right property? You know, am I doing it right? Am I going to lose money? All that sort of stuff. How do how do you handle that? So, it, it just brings me to the thought that, uh, not saying I'm courageous, but the definition of courageous is not the absence of fear, but it's doing things regardless of fear, right? And so, and that's then I see that with with real estate investing. I mean, we just, uh, yeah, I mean, we're signing something on close to half a million dollar deal, and it's like that's scary. I don't, you know. That's scary, and uh, I mean, it was it was terrifying, and and um, I mean, waking up in the middle of the night, worrying about it, and just am I doing the right thing? And and we're talking as we're getting to the game time, right? I, I like to, where you're actually signing this stuff, um, and and I've talked to other investors here and other and other friends, and it is scary every time for for at least the people for me and the people that I know well enough to have this conversation with, uh, but that fear doesn't stop us from doing it. And, and the fear keeps you alert. And I, I mean, I, I have, I made, I've made plenty of mistakes and, you know, and um, there's no perfect property, but being, but being scared is, is a healthy thing and, and it keeps you alert and, and will p potentially keep you from doing pitfalls. We've also avoided some landmine of properties um, because I put a lot of pressure on myself to try to do this quickly and it was going slow. And so there's a tension there and, and it almost made me pull the trigger on some pretty, some properties that I'm really glad I didn't. And, and it was, and I mean, those are agonizing decisions too, but, but we made the right ones. And, and I know that because a couple months later, the right property comes up. If it's a, you know, not perfect, none of these properties are perfect, but they were good fits for us. Uh, the numbers looked really well and we moved and, I mean, I'll tell you in 20 years how well it works, but uh, I think we're on a pretty good path. Yeah, you're definitely yeah. on a good path. I know out of the 30 plus properties that I've, I have, um, I'd say maybe one or two are perfect. Like outside of that, they're 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 literally either singles or doubles. Like we just, as long as we're getting passive income, as long as we're not losing money on the property, and we're making money to provide for our families, we're going to do really, really well. This this duplex, um, it has a steep driveway, you know. Like a like a like a dang steep driveway and steep roads and and stuff are, they're pretty uh, common here in Alaska in, in Alaska and Ketchikan especially we're on a rock that just goes straight down into the ocean so um, steep roads are common but uh, here I am from California and I come and look at this place and um, we bought bought this sight unseen from my wife I just bought the place she hasn't even seen it and I'm like signing the papers on it you know so that talk about you know courage but. Um, but yeah, that's that steep driveway is something I just completely overlooked, and we've actually had some problems with problems with tenants because uh, you know sliding sideways down because you know th then the snow comes and the ice, and um, 
you know, and then like one time we, we took my little girl sledding, which was awesome. We went down the hill sledding, but then my tenants in their minivan tried to drive up our sled marks and it was not a good outcome, you know? <laughs> <was>, so, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And they, um, you know, they, so that was not good, but you know, again, like you said, it was just, uh, you, you make mistakes, you learn and you move on. And, um, so we, we have a, we now have a guy that plows the driveway every year and it's, um, you know, depending on how much snow we get, uh, cause people think Alaska, they think it's crazy, you know, cold, but it's uh will snow for three, four days and then the rain will wash it away. So we, you know, average temperature in July or in, uh, January is like 45 degrees. So snow comes and goes. Uh, so, but it costs us about, I don't know, 500 to a thousand a year. So, um, you know, there, when it, we first realized how big a problem was, I thought, oh my gosh, I made the mistake of my life and all this, but it actually just comes down to dollars and cents. And, um, you know, it's our, our tenants don't have any issues getting up and down it, you know, even with the two wheel drive car. So what other, I had four, Go ahead. I had four wheel drive. So for me, you know, a steep snowy driveway is actually something cool. It's, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> so what other lessons have you learned? Can you think of even anything from like having a property manager and making sure that they're working well in another state, any other lessons that you've learned that you can share with us? Oh yeah. I mean, <laughs> I've learned, uh, uh, shoot. Um, yeah, I've, I've learned a whole lot. I mean, the driveway, um, we bought, see, here's, here's a good lesson. So here's, we, we came up here and, um, Chuck, the owner of this company I work for, he is a brilliant businessman and he's been a, just a wonderful, wonderful mentor of mine. Uh, I've learned so much from him and he's, he's an old float plane guy. So he's owned float plane businesses and he's built them up and sold them. And, and, um, so one day we we're, we were going to buy this house and it was a duplex and it needed a lot of work. And, um, you know, we we're, just like, I kind of feel like we're getting in over our head, but you know, that's kind of how I do things. I just dive right in, you know? And so, uh, I was like, all right. And we're down to the final, you know, we had accepted offer. We had inspection. We had everything. We were down at the final. Okay. Move forward. As soon as we signed this, I mean, we're buying the loans going through everything. We had the loan set up, everything was ready. And we had, um, we had a, a an hour before, you know, every, we were meet to, to sign all this. So we had an hour to decide whether we we're going to buy this place. We go back over the place and my wife just says, I don't want to buy it, you know? And so here I am going, well, and, and again, I put a lot of pressure on myself and that's maybe another, another thing is, is, you know, pressure is good, but it could also be bad if it leads, it leads you to doing rash decisions that you wouldn't normally make. Um, but I was just going to go through with it. She said no. And so, we pushed the meeting back and said, we need another day. And, um, I mean, that was a really stressful time. Um, and I had a meeting with Chuck the next morning and I tell him, I lay it all out, tell him about all this. And he, he says, Oh, he goes, that's easy. He goes in a float plane in the, in the pilot world. Uh, if there's two pilots, the, the rule needs to be two yeses to go and one no to stay. So if, if the weather's marginal, if they're trying to decide, both pilots have to agree to fly, but if either one of them could cancel the whole trip. And that way you're lying on the intellect of two. If one person ha like, had the authority to override the next, you're just relying on the intellect of one. When he told me that, it was just like a huge weight lifted off my shoulders. And I trusted my wife and I called and, and you, you know, there's a, all this buildup too. Everyone's waiting for your answer and it's a big big number, big decision. Um, and just a call and, you know, uh, it was, it was a big decision, but, uh, it was a huge weight lifted. And, and, um, yeah, about two, three months later, this place came up and this place was just hands down in every single way, aside from the steep driveway, it was a, a much better deal. And so it was uh, in the end, just a great decision. And I learned a really valuable lesson there. That is a huge lesson. I know that any time, literally just about any any single time that I have went against what my wife has said, like, I don't think we should do this. This is not the right decision. And I've gone against it. It's usually come back to bite me. And so that's why God's blessed me with my amazing wife is to help me to make wise decisions. And so now from now on, actually, it was a while ago I learned this because after 
you know, time and time again, being I should have listened or I should have listened then or I should have listened then. I realize it's so much better to have two brains working it out because I have blinders, even as you know, I might think I'm like great at finding properties or whatever it might be, whatever decision it might be. I might be thinking I might be great at it, but my wife has a different perspective and I might have, and I don't say might, I do have blinders on that kind of cloud my judgment. Having somebody from the outside or somebody else that has a different intellect that like you were saying, two deci- or two minds coming together have a much better, clear understanding. And so I think also that's even like a marriage thing in general. Like if you're married, if your spouse says, no, I don't think so, you should probably rethink it. Like just my strong opinion. And uh, I'm pretty um, uh, decisive person. And when my wife, if I make a decision and my wife says, well, I, you, we probably shouldn't, or this is my reason of why we shouldn't do it. I literally force myself to take a step back and say, okay, let me listen to my wife. She's much smarter than me. So let me listen to that. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm a big picture guy, you know, like I, like you said, you know, I, I could, I'm, good at the the overall plan and you know i could tell you where we're we're heading in the next 10 years and just how this property is going to fit into this plan and all the the big stuff the numbers the rent what are we going to do all that stuff uh but my wife is really good at the details and 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 the converse of that is me being focused so focused on the big picture that i just i glaze over so many of the details and on that specific property my wife was going hey these details are a lot bigger of a deal than you think and these details i think are going to you know, make this a tough opportunity for us. And she was absolutely right. And, and, uh, so another guy bought it and I go and all those details are still there yet. He wasn't, he hasn't fixed any of them. So it's, it's, and it was just a lot bigger project than we were thinking. I remember talking to you about that, that, that project. And you were saying, you were giving me all the, the big, like that we could do this, we could do this. And my, my man, my brain, I'm kind of like, well, yeah, you probably could. But then hearing how Amy, you know, her perspective and my wife saying much more detail oriented. I'm definitely not. And so she helps with that perspective. So you are a very driven person, um, just like me. I'm very, very driven. I can keep pushing. In fact, I remember a number of conversations you and I have had. Oh, man, it's just taking forever to find that house. It's just, I, can't, I just I want to get another one. I can't, I'm just sitting on the this- bank burning a hole in my pocket. You know? <laughs> it's a good problem to have. But as your patient. And as you are looking, you're constantly looking for more properties, a deal will eventually come. It's just being patient and not jumping on bad properties. That's the thing. We never buy bad properties. We never buy lemons that are actually going to be losing us money. We want to find properties that are going to be good investments. And I'll give you an example. So I have students that would say, hey, this one investor is selling like 10 properties all in a bundle. Like you buy all 10 at once. There's a certain price. He discounted all that sort of stuff. I always tell them, it doesn't matter how many they're trying to sell. That's what they'd like. But you analyze each property as if it's by itself. If, it, yeah. if there's a lemon in there, even if it's 100 properties and you have one lemon, don't do it. We do not buy any lemons or any bad properties. We just don't do that. And so you're really blessed now that after listening to your wife, your helper saying, hey, we shouldn't do this. Now you have this fourplex that is actually making you money. That's awesome. So anything any insights into managing your own properties? Because we, I love talking about having other people manage the properties. What other insights have you seen after managing your own properties? Well, um, you know, that's, there's, there's a lot of, uh, a lot to it. You know, it's a lot of work. I mean, just, you have a vacancy uh, here, here in Ketchikan, there's, there's been a, a shortage of housing pretty much from the beginning of the town uh it's and so uh when you, when you have a vacancy posted you just get flooded with applicants and people wanting to uh, and a lot of them just are just the vast majority of nine out of ten don't uh, don't qualify and so just feeling those calls alone it's just a, uh, it's just a lot it's just all day kind of thing setting up meetings and you know doing it uh so Property managers work, you know, it's, and if they, if they have a, a great system, I mean, that's kind of what you're paying for, uh, you know, and, uh, cause we have another prop, our, we have a property manager managing our property in Fresno and it's a much larger company, but they have systems that work well, you know, um, and doing it all on your own. I really, uh, it's, it's hard, <laughs> you know, uh, but also the up here, you know, with the fourplex, the, the amount of rent that we're bringing in, um, 10% of that gross, it's a lot of money, 
you know? So I'm going to spend a lot more time to do that because of the, uh, uh, the, the amount of money relative to um, how many units we have to manage, you know? And you have but, the time uh, too. You have the time and the ability. And I have the time. Yeah, there's a correlation between time and money. You know, do I do I source something out? Do I? I mean, and and there's there's a definite there's a huge thing once you scale up, especially that your time is valuable, right? So if so if you're wasting your time doing other things when you could more effectively spend that time, like me fishing, I make X amount of money. If 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 I uh, have to take a day off to do something where I could pay somebody, um, there there's going to be a point where it's not worth it for me to take the day off. It's going to be a point where it is, you know, there, there's some footings here and we got quoted a couple bids just to replace some concrete footings around 800 bucks. Um, I took, uh, I didn't even take a day off. I had a day off. It took me four hours and a hundred dollars of material. I got it done. So I'm like, shoot, how much do the math? 700 bucks for four hours of work. Um, And that's another thing about here in Ketchikan is contractors out here are absolutely absurd. In in Oklahoma, you could probably get that done for you know two hundred bucks, but but up here it was it was eight. Um, so that high cost of contractors um, really encourages me to do a lot of stuff myself, you know. And you have the ability to because you live I literally do. live really close. Yeah, I, I live close. I, I live uh, ten minutes away from the property. You know, I've I've done dishwashers and you know the. Um, uh, garbage disposals and, uh, concrete stuff and just, yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, especially with this COVID thing, have a lot more time than money on my hands. So it's just, uh, I've been doing it myself and, and I see the value now when I'm young and able and I have the time and the resources to do it. Um, it's, it's a great thing just because I'm also learning to do it, you know, and, um, you know, I talk about, uh, wanting to build a house. And so, I volunteered or, you know, I, to, uh, help someone build a house this, I, I've four months of my life just because the knowledge I will learn is absolutely priceless, you know? And something and I definitely in... want to touch on because, um, I sure. firmly believe that if you can learn by working for somebody else, cause usually we all are all taught you work to make money, but how much better is it to work, to learn something that you can then make even more money from. So what you're saying is, you know, somebody who's already a builder, who's already done before, has yep. experience He's that will literally show you how to do it. You're not going to mm-hmm. like, if you go to college, you pay somebody to show you how to do X, Y, or Z, whatever it might be. No, you're not actually going to have to pay. You're going to learn and you're going to be working for him. But at the same time, all the invaluable information you're going to get from learning from him. Is that correct? Absolutely. And, and he's, he's close to retiring. This is going to be the last house, uh, that he does. And so I offered, I said, uh, Hey, uh, I'd like to work for you when you build this house. Cause we went to lunch and he was, uh, he's built, he's starting a house in November. And I said, Hey, I'd like to work for you. And he's like, ah, you know, cause I told him I'm just dumb labor, right? I don't have any skills. So he, um, but I told him, I said, you know, that I'm not concerned about money just because the skills that I would learn is worth way more than, uh, way more than anything you could pay me on a paycheck. And, uh, so that kind of, you know, and so, uh, there's a good chance I'm going to be, be helping them there. And it, what, what that does is that, you know, when it comes time, you know, if you, I think, I, I feel if you're going to build spec homes, you gotta, you gotta have your contract license, run a crew and all that stuff. Um, and you could hire talented people that could build a house, but if you don't know what you're doing to put all the pieces together, I mean, that's just, you, you don't have to know every little detail, but what I'm looking for is the big picture, you know? And, um, I mean, I, I took a guy, I've been taking a group fishing, uh, yes, the last several days. And, um, the, the guy has absolutely just made a fortune in real estate building spec houses. I mean, he said he built a hundred, 135 a year. And he says that, um, he could drive down the street at 30 miles an hour and tell if a, a house is plumb or not. Or, 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 or something that someone's working on. And he says he, he's just been known to slam on the brakes, back up, say, what the heck, get the, get the level and go. So it was his, so he wasn't actually doing the work, but he knew it so in depth that he could effectively manage the people doing the work. So you got to have this knowledge base. And for me, that's, uh, that's going to be this, this winter. And I don't really have you know, because of this the COVID lockdown, there's really not much else going on. We were going to go to Hawaii for six months. I had my wife talked into that one, but I just 
I just don't see that happening. So we're <laughs> staying here in town and I'll be uh, out in the elements uh, building a house, hopefully. So Awesome. Well, Chris, thank you so much. Do you have anything else that you can add? Anything else that we might have missed in building a business of real estate investing? Yeah. So one of the things I learned, uh, you know, from a, being a charter captain is uh, the ability to grow. You know, you don't have to know absolutely everything about fishing um, to come out here and, and be a charter captain. I mean, you, you should. But when I first came, we were doing these camp trips, you know, and, and we just went out in a skiff and we just the idea was to catch a couple fish, go into a camp and have a shore lunch, you know, so that it wasn't about going out and just catching everything. And I remember my very first trip, we caught two fish like that and i was just like yeah you know i was so stoked and um you know so nine years later you know uh we just the production of it we just catch so much more it's just the biomass that we bring in i mean you've seen it it's just absolutely insane and i would never ever be content or happy with two rockfish you know and so just the the nine years of growth is really just um you know, just taking me to a whole nother level that I didn't even know was possible. And I real estate's been the same thing. And and I just think that, um, and, and I see it already, you know, um, you know, I'm, I'm not even halfway through my career or at least hopefully. Right. You know, but, um, you know, I just keep catching bigger fish, you know, and, uh, I just see that just growing as, as time goes on. And that's, I think everybody should be the, their entire life. I don't care if you're 20 years old or 80 years old, I would like to, at least I hope to, when I'm as just every single day, constantly learning, constantly growing and constantly getting better. Cause I, one of my favorite movies is called Tommy boy and a mm-hmm. line in there. Yeah. You know, it, uh, a line in there yep. always gets me is when the dad says you're either growing or you're dying. There's no third direction. Mm. So you always, wow. I always believe you always need to be growing and getting better. And the experience helps you get better and you make better decisions, make better proper or buy better properties and make more money. It's just better as you keep growing. Absolutely. And, and part of growing is making mistakes. And if you're scared of making mistakes, you're never going to go anywhere. I have the amount of stuff that I've torn up fishing and the amount of stupid stuff I've done, the amount of times I've embarrassed myself. Um, I mean, I got stories, right. You know, but that's why you go with an experienced guide. Cause they do all that stupid stuff with other people. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it's just like you said, just move forward and, and yeah, you're going to make mistakes, but that's part of the fun. And You'll I learn. am, yeah, I, I absolutely wholeheartedly say and recommend go up to Barnoff fishing up in uh, catch a can if you can get with Chris, like specifically ask for Chris sure. Baldwin and fish with Chris, he literally knows so many spots to put you on getting, getting halibut or getting salmon or getting lean cod or whatever it might be. You're like, Hey, Chris would ask us, what do you guys want to catch now? Like, okay, let's go get lean cod. Okay. I got a spot. Boom. We get a lean cod like in two seconds. So everybody, yeah. if you go up to Alaska, if you love fishing at all, you must go to catch a can barn off fishing was great. They, they definitely take care of me when I'm up there and it's always fun being with Chris, but, uh, he has so many good stories you know, too. That he tells us, and it, you know, yeah, the fishing up there is not always like that, you know, uh, but just well, the, he, he's trying to manage expectations. He's trying to make sure you, you gotta, <laughs> expectations are some of the most important things in life, right? That just <laughs> manages your outcome is your, what you expect going into anything. Uh, but fishing, you know, is like that too. But, um, but yeah, the amount of biomass here in this ocean is just unreal and going out and just to these wild places and, and dropping down to this place. And you could just feel that this place is alive with, with, with life. It's just so amazing. Uh, yeah. but yeah, to, to check us out, uh, exclusive Uh, that's our website. And, uh, yeah, you could book, um, and you could request me and it, uh, particularly if you're coming up on a cruise, that's a good time to book, but, um, but yeah, it's a lot of fun. Awesome. Well, Chris, I'm definitely have to get up there and go fishing with you hopefully this summer, but, uh, it's been super awesome having you on. I really appreciate you being on the show. Yeah. Thank you, Dusty.